Hello everyone, this is Pastor Dan again from Athens Christian Reformed Church and uh, today we are going to start reading the third book in the Chronicles of Narnia and this is by C.S. Lewis of course and the book is called The Horse and His Boy. So hopefully you can see that. Now uh, maybe you can also see that my book is falling apart so but we'll get on with it. The Horse and His Boy, Chapter 1, How Shasta Set Out on His Travels. This is the story of an adventure that happened in Narnia and Calarman and the lands between in the Golden Age when Peter was high king in Narnia and his brother and his two sisters were king and queens under him. In those days, far south in Calarman, on a little creek of the sea, there lived a poor fisherman named Arshish, and with him there lived a boy who called him father. The boy's name was Shasta. On most days, Arshish went out to, in his boat to fish in the morning, and in the afternoon he harnessed his donkey to a cart and loaded the cart with fish and went a mile or so southward to the village to sell it. If it had sold well, he would come home in a moderately good temper and say nothing to Shasta, but if it had sold badly, he would find fault with him and perhaps beat him. There was always something to find fault with, for Shasta had plenty of work to do, mending and washing the nets, cooking the supper, and cleaning the cottage in which they both lived. Shasta was not at all interested in anything that lay south of his home, because he had once or twice been to the village with Arshish, and he knew that there was nothing very interesting there. In the village, he only met other men who were just like his father, men with long, dirty robes and wooden shoes turned up at the toe and turbans on their heads and beards talking to one another very slowly about things that sounded dull. But he was very interested in everything that lay to the north because no one ever went that way and he was never allowed there to go there himself. When he was sitting out of doors, mending the nets and all alone, he would often look eagerly to the north. One could see nothing but a grassy slope running up to a level ridge, and beyond that the sky with perhaps a few birds in it. Sometimes, if Arshish was there, Shasta would say, Oh, my father, what is there beyond the hill? And then, if the fisherman was in a bad temper, he would box Shasta's ears and tell him to attend to his work. Or, if he was in a peaceable mood, he would say, Oh, my son, do not allow your mind to be distracted by idle questions. For one of the poets has said, Application to business is the root of prosperity. But those who ask questions that do not concern them are steering the ship of folly towards the rock of indigence. Shasta thought that beyond the hill there must be some delightful secret which his father wished to hide from him. In reality, however, the fisherman talked like this because he didn't know what lay to the north. Neither did he care. He had a very practical mind. One day there came from the south a stranger who was unlike any man that Shasta had ever seen before. He rode upon a strong dappled horse with flowing mane and tail, and his stirrups and bridle were inlaid with silver. The spike of a helmet projected from the middle of his silken turban, and he wore a shirt of chain mail. By his side hung a curving scimitar, a round shield studded with bosses of brass hung at his back, and his right hand grasped a lance. His face was dark, but this did not surprise Shasta, because all the people of Calamon are like that. What did surprise him was the man's beard, which was dyed crimson and curled and gleaming with scented oil. But Arshish knew by the gold on the stranger's bare arm that he was a Tarkin or great lord, and he bowed kneeling before him till his beard touched the earth and made signs to Shasta to kneel also. The stranger demanded hospitality for the night, which of course the fisherman dared not refuse. All the best they had was set before the Tarkin for supper, and he didn't think much of it. And Shasta, as always happened when the fisherman had company, was given a hunk of bread and turned out of the cottage. On these occasions, he usually slept with the donkey in its little thatched stable. 
but it was much too early to go to sleep yet, and Shasta, who had never learned that it was wrong to listen behind doors, sat down with his ear to a crack in the wooden wall of the cottage to hear what the grown-ups were talking about. And this is what he heard. And now, O oh my host, said the Tarkin, I have a mind to buy that boy of yours. O oh, my master, replied the fisherman, and Shasta knew by the wheedling tone and the, the greedy look that was probably coming into his face as he said it. What price could you induce your servant, poor though he is, to sell into slavery his only child and his own flesh? Has not one of the poets said, natural affection is stronger than soup, and offspring more precious than carbuncles? It is even so, replied the guest dryly, but another poet has likewise said, he who attempts to deceive the judicious is already bearing his own back for the scourge. Do not load your aged mouth with falsehoods. This boy is manifestly no son of yours, for your cheek is as black as mine, but the boy is fair and white, like the accursed but beautiful barbarians who inhabit the remote north. How well it was said, answered the fisherman, that swords can be kept off with the shields, but the eyes of wisdom pierces through every defense. Know then, O oh my formidable guest, that because of my extreme poverty I have never married and have no child, but in that same year in which the Tisrock, may he live forever, began his august and beneficent reign, on a night when the moon was at her full, it pleased the gods to deprive me of my sleep. Therefore, I arose from my bed in this hovel and went forth to the beach to refresh myself with looking upon the water and the moon and breathing the cool air. And presently I heard a noise as of oars coming to me across the water, and then, as it were, a weak cry. And shortly after, the tide brought to the land a little boat in which there was nothing but a man, lean with extreme hunger and thirst, who seemed to have died but a few moments before, for he was still warm, and an empty water skin, and a child still living. Doubtless, said I, these unfortunates have escaped from the wreck of a great ship, but by the admirable designs of the gods, the elder has starved himself to keep the child alive and has perished in sight of land. Accordingly, remembering how the gods never fail to reward those who befriend the destitute, and being moved by my compassion, for your servant is a man of tender heart, leave out these idle words in your own praise interrupted the Tarkin. It is enough to know that you took the child and have had ten times the worth of his daily bread out of him in labor, as anyone can see. And now, tell me at once what price you put on him, for I am wearied with your loquacity. You yourself have widely, wisely said, answered Arshish, that the boy's labor has been to me of inestimable value. There must be taken into account in fixing the price. For if I sell the boy, I must undoubtedly either buy or hire another to do his work. I'll give you fifteen crescents for him, said the Tarkin. Fifteen? cried Arshish in a voice that something, was something between a whine and a scream. Fifteen? For the prop of my old age and the delight of my eyes, do not mock my grey beard, Tarkin though you be. My price is seventy. At this point... Shasta got up and tiptoed away. He had heard all he wanted, for he had often listened when men were bargaining in the village and knew how it was done. He was quite certain that Arshish would sell him in the end for something much more than fifteen crescents and much less than seventy, but that he and the Tarkin would take hours in getting to an agreement. You must not imagine that Shasta felt at all as you and I would feel if we had just overheard our parents talking about selling us for slaves. For one thing, his life was already little better than slavery. For all he knew, the lordly stranger on the great horse might be kinder to him than Arshish. For another, the story about his own discovery in the boat had filled him with excitement and with a sense of relief. He had often been uneasy, because, try as he might, he had never been able to love the fisherman, and he knew that a boy ought to love his father. Now, apparently, he was no relation to Arshish at all. That took a great weight off his mind. Why, I might be anyone, he thought. 
I might be the son of a Tarkin myself, or the son of the Tisrock, may he live forever, or of a god. He was standing out in the grassy place before the cottage while he thought those things. Twilight was coming on apace, and a star or two was already out, but the remains of the sunset could still be seen in the west. Not far away, the stranger's horse, loosely tied to an iron ring in the wall of the donkey's stable, was grazing. Shasta strolled over to it and patted its neck. It went on tearing up the grass and took no notice of him. Then another thought came into Shasta's mind. I wonder what sort of a man that Tarkin is, he said out loud. It would be splendid if he was kind. Some of the, the slaves in a great lord's house have next to nothing to do. They wear lovely clothes and meet, eat meat every day. Perhaps he'd take me to the wars, and I'd save his life in a battle, and then he'd set me free and adopt me as his son and give me a palace and a chariot and a suit of armor. But then he might be a horrid, cruel man. He might send me to work on the fields in chains. I wish I knew. How could I know? I bet this horse knows, if only he could tell me. The horse had lifted its head. Shasta stroked its smooth as satin nose and said, I wish you could talk, old fellow. And then, for a second, he thought he was dreaming, for quite distinctly, though in a low voice, the horse said, But I can. Shasta stared into its great eyes, and his own grew almost as big with astonishment. However did you learn to talk? Hush, not so loud, replied the horse. Where I come from, nearly all the animals talk. Wherever is that? asked Shasta. Narnia, answered the horse. The happy land of Narnia. Narnia of the heathery mountains and the thymy downs. Narnia of the many rivers, the flashing glens, the mossy caverns, and the deep forests ringing with the hammers of the dwarfs. <laughs> Oh, the sweet air of Narnia. An hour's life there is better than a thousand years in Calamon. <laughs> it ended with a whinny that sounded very like a sigh. How did you get here? said Shasta. Kidnapped, said the horse, or stolen or captured, whichever you like to call it. I was only a foal at the time. My mother warned me not to range the southern slopes into Arkenland and beyond, but I wouldn't heed her. And by the lion's mane, I have paid for my folly. All these years I have been a slave to humans, hiding my true nature and pretending to be dumb and witless like their horses. Why didn't you tell them who you were? Not such a fool, that's why. If they once found out that I could talk, they would have made a show of me at fairs and guarded me more carefully than ever. My last chance of escape would have been gone. And why, began Shasta, but the horse interrupted him. Now look, it said, we mustn't waste time in idle questions. You want to know about my master, the Tarkin and Radden? Well, he's bad, not too bad for me. For a war horse costs too much to be treated very badly, but you'd be better living, lying dead tonight than go to be a human slave in his house tomorrow. Then I'd better run away, said Shasta, turning very pale. Yes, you had, said the horse, but why not run away with me? Are you going to run away too, said Shasta? Yes, if you'll come with me, answered the horse. This is a chance for both of us. You see, if I run away without a rider, everyone who sees me will say, Stray horse, and be after me as quick as he can. With the rider, I have a chance to get through. That's where you can help me. On the other hand, you can't get very far on those two silly legs of yours. What absurd legs humans have without being overtaken. But on me, you can outdistance any horse in this country. That's where I can help you. By the way, I suppose you know how to ride. Oh, yes, of course, said Shasta. At least I've ridden the donkey. Ridden the what? retorted the horse with extreme contempt. At least that is what he meant. It actually came out in a sort of a, a neigh. Ridden the what? Talking horses always become more horsey in accent when they are angry. In other words, he continued, you can't ride. 
That is a drawback. I'll have to teach you as we go along if you can't ride. Can you fall? I suppose anyone can fall, said Shasta. I mean, can you fall and get up again without crying and mount again and fall again and not be afraid of falling? Well, I'll try, said Shasta. Poor little beast, said the horse in a gentler tone. I forget you're only a fool. We'll make a fine rider of you in time. And now, we mustn't start until those two in the hut are asleep. Meantime, we can make our plans. My Tarkin is on his way north to the great city, to Tashban itself in the court of the Tisrock. I say, put in Shasta in a rather shocked voice, oughtn't you to say, may he live forever? Why? asked the horse. I'm a free Narnian, and why should I talk slaves fool and fools talk? I don't want him to live forever, and I know that he's not going to live forever whether I want him to or not. And I can see you're from the free north, too. No more of this southern jargon between you and me. And now, back to our plans. As I said, my human was on his way north to Tashman. Does that mean we'd better go to the south? I think not, said the horse. You see, he thinks I'm dumb and witless like his other horses. Now, if I really were, the moment I got loose, I'd go back home to my stable and paddock. Back to his palace, which is two days' journey south. That's where he'll look for me. He'd never dream of my going not of my going on north on my own. And anyway, he will probably think that someone in the last village who saw him ride through has followed us to here and stolen me. Oh, hooray, said Shasta. Then we'll go north. I've been longing to go north all my life. Oh, of course you have said Chasta. Then we'll go north. I've been longing to go to the north all my life. Uh, excuse me. Of course you have, said the horse. That's because of the blood that's in you. I'm sure you're true northern stock, but not too loud. I should think they'd be asleep soon now. I'd better creep back and see, suggested Shasta. That's a good idea, said the horse, but take care you're not caught. It was a good deal darker now, and very silent except for the sound of the waves on the beach, which Shasta hardly noticed, because he had been hearing it day and night as long as he could remember. The cottage, as he approached it, showed no light. When he listened at the front, there was no noise. When he went round to the only window, he could hear, after a second or two, the familiar noise of the old fisherman's squeaky snore. It was funny to think that if all went well, he would never hear it again. Holding his breath and feeling a bit sorry, but much less sorry than he was glad, Shasta glided away over the grass and went to the donkey's stable, groped along to a place he knew where the key was hidden, opened the door, and found the horse's saddle and bridle, which had been locked up there for, for the night. He bent forward and kissed the donkey's nose. I'm sorry we can't take you, he said. There you are at last, said the horse when he got back to it. I was beginning to wonder what had become of you. I was getting your things out of the stable, replied Shasta. And now, can you tell me how to put them on? For the next few minutes, Shasta was at work very cautiously to avoid jingling, while the horse said things like, Get that girth a bit tighter, or you'll find a buckle lower down, or you'll need to shorten those stirrups a good bit. When all was finished, he said, now, we've got to have reins for the look of the thing, but you won't be using them. Tie them to the saddle bow, very slack, so that I can do what I like with my head. And remember, you are not to touch them. What are they for, then? asked Shasta. Ordinarily, they are for directing me, replied the horse. But as I intend to do all the directing on this journey, you'll please keep your hands to yourself. And there's another thing. I'm not going to have you grabbing my mane. But I say, pleaded Shasta, if I'm not to hold on by the reins or by your mane, what am I to hold on by? You hold on with your knees, said the horse. That's the secret of good riding. Grip my body between your knees as hard as you like. Sit straight up, straight as a poker. Keep your elbows in. And by the way, what did you do with the spurs? Put them on my heels, of course, said Shasta. I do know that much. Then you can take them off and put them in the saddlebag. We may be able to sell them when we get to Tashren. Ready? Uh, now I think you can get up. 
Oh, you're, you're a dreadful height, gasped Shasta after his first and unsuccessful attempt. I'm a horse, that's all, was the reply. Anyone would think I was a haystack from the way you're trying to climb up me. There, that's better. Now, sit up and remember what I told you about your knees. Funny to think of me, who's led cavalry charges and won races, having a potato sack like you in the saddle. However, off we go, he chuckled, not unkindly. And he certainly began their night journey with great caution. First of all, he went just south of the fisherman's cottage to the little river, which there ran into the sea, and took great care to leave in the mud some very plain hoof marks pointing south. But as soon as they were in the middle of the ford, he turned upstream and waited till they were about a hundred yards further inland than the cottage. Then he selected a nice gravelly bit of bank, which would take no footprints, and came out on the northern side. Then, still at a walking pace, he went northward till the cottage, the one tree, the donkey stable, and the creek, everything, in fact, that Shasta had ever known had sunk out of sight in the gray summer night darkness. They had been going uphill, and now were at the top of the ridge, that ridge which had always been the boundary of Shasta's known world. He could not see what was ahead, except that it was all open and grassy. It looked endless, wild and lonely and free. I say, observed the horse, what a place for a gallop, eh? Oh, don't let's, said Shasta. Not yet. I don't know how to, please. Horse, I don't know your name. <laughs> said the horse. I'll never be able to say that, said Shasta. Can I call you Bree? Well, if it's the best you can do, I suppose you must, said the horse. And what shall I call you? I'm called Shasta. Hmm, said Bree. Well, now, there's a name that's really hard to pronounce. But now about this gallop. It's a good deal easier than trotting if you only knew because you don't have to rise and fall. Grip with your knees and keep your eyes straight ahead between my ears. Don't look at the ground. If you think you're going to fall, just grip harder and sit up straighter. Ready? Now, for Narnia and the North. And that is the end of chapter one. Chapter 2. A Wayside Adventure It was nearly noon on the following day when Shasta was wakened by something warm and soft moving over his face. He opened his eyes and found himself staring into the long face of a horse. Its nose and lips were almost touching his. He remembered the exciting events of the previous night and sat up, but as he did so, he groaned. Oh, Bree, he gasped. I'm so sore all over. I can hardly move. Good morning, small one, said Bree. I was afraid you might feel a bit stiff. It can't be the falls. You didn't have more than a dozen or so, and it was all lovely, soft, springy turf. That must have been almost a pleasure to fall on. And the only one that might have been nasty was broken by that gorse bush. No, oh, it's the riding itself that comes hard at first. What about breakfast? I've had mine. Oh, bother breakfast. Bother everything, said Shasta. I tell you, I can't move. But the horse nuzzled at him with his nose and pawed him gently with a hoof till he had to get up. And then he looked about him and saw where they were. Behind them laid a little copse. Before them, the turf dotted with white flowers sloped down to the brow of a cliff. Far below them, so that the sound of the breaking waves was very faint, lay the sea. Shasta had never seen it from such a height, and never seen so much of it before, nor dreamed how many colors it had. On either hand, the coast stretched away, headland after headland, and at the points you could see the white foam running up the rocks, but making no noise because it was so far off. There were gulls flying overhead, and the heat shivered on the ground. It was a blazing day. But what Shasta chiefly noticed was the air. He couldn't think what was minning, missing until at last he realized there was no smell of fish in it. For, of course, neither in the cottage nor among the nets had he ever been away from the smell of fish in his life. 
And this new air was so delicious, and his all, and all his old life seemed so far away that he forgot for a moment about his bruises and his aching muscles and said, I say, Bree, didn't you say something about breakfast? Yes, I did, answered Bree. I think you'll find something in the saddlebags. They're over there on that tree where you hung them up last night, or early this morning, rather. They investigated the saddlebags, and the results were cheering. A meat pasty, only slightly stale, a lump of dried figs, and another lump of green cheese, a little flask of wine, and some money, about forty crescents in all, which was more than Shasta had ever seen. While Shasta sat down painfully and cautiously with his back against a tree and started on the pasty, Bree had a few more mouthfuls of grass to keep him company. Won't it be stealing to use the money? asked Shasta. Oh, said the horse, looking up with his mouth full of grass. I never thought of that. A free horse and a talking horse mustn't steal, of course. But I think it's all right. We're prisoners and captives in enemy country. That money is booty, spoil. Besides, how are we to get any food for you without it? I suppose, like all humans, you won't eat natural food like grass and oats. I can't. Ever tried? Yes, I have. I can't get it down at all. You couldn't either if you were me. You're rum little creatures, you humans, remarked Bree. When Shasta had finished his breakfast, which was by far the nicest he had ever eaten, Bree said, I think I'll have a nice roll before we put on that saddle again. And he proceeded to do so. That's good. That's very good, he said, rubbing his back on the turf and waving all four legs in the air. You ought to have one too, Shasta, he snorted. It's most refreshing. But Shasta burst out laughing and said, You do look funny when you're on your back. I look nothing of the sort, said Bree. Then suddenly he rolled round on his side, raised his head, and looked hard at Shasta, blowing a little. Does it really look funny? He asked in an anxious voice. Yes, it does, replied Shasta, but what does it matter? You don't think, do you? said Bree, that it might be a thing talking horses never do, a silly clownish trick I've learned from the dumb ones. It would be dreadful to find, when I get back to Narnia, that I've picked up a lot of low, bad habits. What do you think, Shasta? Honestly, now, don't spare my feelings. Do you think the real free horses, the talking kind, roll? How should I know? Anyway, I don't think I should bother about it if I were you. We've got to get there first. Do you know the way? I know my way to Tashpan. After that comes the desert. Oh, we'll manage the desert somehow, never fear. Why, well, we'll be in sight of the northern mountains then. Think of it, to Narnia and the north. <sighs> Nothing will stop us then. But I'd be glad to be past Tashpan. You and I are safer away from cities. Can't we avoid it? Not without going a long way inland, and that would take us into cultivated land and main roads, and I wouldn't know the way. No, we'll just have to creep along the coast. Up here on the downs, we'll meet nothing but sheep and rabbits and gulls and a few shepherds. And by the way, what about starting? Shasta's legs ached terribly as he saddled Bree and climbed into the saddle. The horse was kindly to him and went at a soft pace all afternoon. When evening twilight came, they dropped by steep tracks into a valley and found a village. Before they got into it, Shasta dismounted and entered it on foot to buy a loaf and some onions and radishes. The horse trotted around by the fields in the dusk and met Shasta at the far side. This became their regular plan every second night. These were great days for Shasta, and every day better than the last, as his muscles hardened and he fell less, less often. Even at the end of his training, Bree still said he sat like a bag of flour in the saddle. And even if it was safe, young'un, I'd be ashamed to be seen with you on the main road. But in spite of his rude words, Bree was a patient teacher. No one could teach riding so well as a horse. Shasta learned to trot, to canter, to jump, and to keep his seat, even when Bree pulled up suddenly or swung unexpectedly to the left or the right, which, as Bree told him, was a thing you might have to do at any moment in a battle. 
And then, of course, Shasta begged to be told of the battles and wars in which Bree had carried the Tarkin, and Bree would tell of forced marches and the fording of swift rivers, of charges and of fierce fights between cavalry and cavalry, when the war horses fought as well as the men, being all fierce stallions trained to bite and kick and to rear at the right moment, so that the horse's weight was as, as well as the riders would come down on an enemy's crest in the stroke of a sword or battle axe. But Bree did not want to talk about the wars as often as Shasta wanted to hear about them. Don't speak of them, youngster, he would say. They were only the Tisrox wars, and I fought in them as a slave and a dumb beast. Give me the Narnian wars, where I shall fight as a free horse among my own people. Those will be wars worth talking about. Narnia and the Orth, bro. <laughs> Shasta soon learned, when he heard Bree talking like that, to prepare for a gallop. After they had traveled on for weeks and weeks, past more bays and headlands and rivers and villages than Shasta could remember, there came a moonlit night when they started their journey at evening, having slept during the day. They had left the downs behind them and were crossing a wide plain with a forest about a half a mile away on their left. The sea, hidden by low sand hills, was about the same distance on their right. They had jogged along for about an hour, sometimes trotting and sometimes walking, when Bree suddenly stopped. What's up? said Shasta. Shh! said Bree, craning his neck round and twitching his ears. Did you hear something? Listen! It sounds like another horse. Between us and the woods, said Shasta, after he'd listened for about a minute. It is another horse, said Bree, and that's what I don't like. Isn't it probably just a farmer riding home late, said, Sa said Shasta with a yawn. Don't tell me, said Bree, that's not a farmer's riding, nor a farmer's horse either. Can't you tell by the sound? That's quality, that horse is, and it's being ridden by a real horseman. I'll tell you what it is, Shasta, there's a Tarkin under the edge of that wood, not on his war horse. It's too light for that. On a fine blood mare, I should say. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's stopped now, whatever it is, said Shasta. You're right, said Bree. And why should he stop just when we do? Shasta, my, my boy, I do believe there's someone shadowing us at last. What shall we do? said Shasta in a lower whisper than before. Do you think he can see us as well as hear us? Not in this light, so long as we stay quite still, answered Bree. But look, there's a cloud coming up. I'll wait till that gets over the moon, then we shall get off our, our right as quietly as we can down to the shore. We can hide among the sand hills if the worst comes to the worst. They waited till the cloud covered the moon, and then first at a walking pace and afterwards at a gentle trot made for the shore. The cloud was bigger and thicker than it had looked at first, and soon the night grew very dark. Just as Shasta was saying to himself, we must be nearly at those sand hills by now, his heart leaped into his mouth because an appalling noise had suddenly risen up out of the darkness ahead. A long, snarling roar, melancholy and utterly savage. Instantly, Bree swerved round and began galloping inland again as fast as he could gallop. What is it? gasped Shasta. Lions, said Bree, without checking his pace or turning his head. After that, there was nothing but sheer galloping for some time. At last, they splashed across a wide, shallow stream, and Bree came to a stop on the far side. Shasta noticed that he was trembling and sweating all over. That water may have thrown the brute off our scent, panted Bree, when he had got partly out, got his breath again. We can walk for a bit now. As they walked, Bree said, Shasta, I'm ashamed of myself. I'm just as frightened as a common dumb calamine horse. I am really. I don't feel like a talking horse at all. I don't mind swords and lances and arrows, but I can't bear those creatures. I think I'll trot for a bit. About a minute later, however, he broke into a gallop again, and no wonder, for the roar broke out again, this time on their left from the direction of the forest. Two of them, moaned Bree. 
When they had galloped for several minutes <coughs> without any further noise from the lions, Shasta said, I say, that other horse is galloping beside us now, only a stone's throw away. All the better on it, panted Bree. Tarkin on it, we'll have a sword, protect us all. But Bree, said Shasta, we might just as well be killed by lions as caught, or I might. They'll hang me for horse stealing. He was feeling less frightened of lions than Bree, because he had never met a lion. Bree had. Bree only snorted in answer, but he did sheer away to his right. Oddly enough, the other horse seemed to be uh, seemed also to be shearing away to the left, so that in a few seconds the space between them had widened a good deal. But as soon as it did, there came two more lions' roars immediately after one on one another, one on the right and the other on the left, and the horses began drawing nearer together. So apparently did the lions. The roaring of the brutes on each side was horribly close, and they seemed to be keeping up with the galloping horses quite easily. Then the cloud rolled away. The moonlight, astonishingly bright, showed up everything almost as if it were broad day. The two horses and two riders were galloping almost neck to neck and knee to knee, just as if they were in a race. Indeed, Bree said afterwards that a finer race had never been seen in Callerman. Shasta now gave himself up for lost and began to wonder whether lions killed you quickly or played with you as a cat plays with a mouse and how much it would hurt. At the same time, one sometimes does this at the most frightful moments, he noticed everything. He saw that the other rider was a very small, slender person, male-clad, the moon shone on the male, and riding magnificently. He had no beard. Something flat and shining was spread out before them. Before Shasta had time even to guess what it was, there was a great splash, and he found his mouth half full of salt water. The shining thing had been a long inlet of the sea. Both horses were swimming, and the water was up to Shasta's knees. There was an angry roaring behind them, and looking back, Shasta saw a great shaggy and terrible shape crouched on the water's edge, but only one. We must have shaken off the other lion, he thought. The lion apparently did not think its prey worth a wetting. At any rate, it made no attempt to take to the water in pursuit. The two horses, side by side, were now well out in the middle of the creek, and the opposite shore could clearly be seen. The Tarkin had not yet spoken a word. But he will, thought Shasta, as soon as we have landed. What am I to say? I must begin thinking out a story. Then suddenly two voices spoke at his side. Oh, I'm so tired, said the one. Hold your tongues, Hwin, and don't be a fool, said the other. I'm dreaming, thought Shasta. I could have sworn that other horse spoke. Soon the horses were no longer swimming, but walking, and soon, with a great sound of water running off their sides and tails, and with a great crunching of pebbles under eight hoofs, they came out on the farther beach of the inlet. The Tarkin, to Shasta's surprise, showed no wish to ask questions. He did not even look at Shasta, but seemed anxious to urge his horse straight on. Bree, however, at once shouldered himself in the other horse's way. Brrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
I think it's very natural, too, said the mare. I wish you'd held your tongue, Wynne, said the girl. Look at the trouble you've got us into. I don't know about trouble, said Shasta. You can clear off as soon as you like. We shan't keep you. No, you shan't, said the girl. What quarrelsome creatures these humans are, said Bree to the mare. They're as bad as mules. Let's try to talk a little sense. I take it, ma'am, your story is the same as mine. Captured in early youth, years of slavery among the Calamines. Too true, said sir, said the mare with a melancholy whinny. And now, perhaps, escape. Tell him to mind his own business, Wynne, said the girl. No, I won't, Erebus, said the mare, putting her ears back. This is my escape, just as much as it's yours. And I'm sure a noble war horse like this is not going to betray us. We are trying to escape, to get to Narnia. And so, of course, are we, said Bree. Of course, you guessed that at once. Little boy in rags riding or trying to ride a war horse at dead of night couldn't mean anything but an escape of some sort. And if I may say so, a high-born Tarkina riding alone at night, dressed up in her brother's armor and very anxious for everyone to mind their own business and ask her no questions. And if that's not fishy, call me a cob. All right, then, said Erebus. You guessed it. When and I are running away, we are trying to get to Narnia. And now, what about it? Why, in that case, what is to prevent us all going together, said Bree. I trust, Madame Bohin, you will accept such assistance and protection as I may be able to give you on the journey. <coughs> Why do you keep talking to my horse instead of to me? asked the girl. Excuse me, Tarkina, said Bree, with just the slightest backward tilt of his ears. But that's Calermine talk. We're free Narnians, Wynn and I, and I suppose if you're running away to Narnia, you want to be one too. In that case, Quinn isn't your horse any longer. One might just as well say you're her human. The girl opened her mouth to speak and then stopped. Obviously, she had not quite seen it in that light before. Still, she said after a moment's pause, I don't know that there is so much point in go all going together. Aren't we more likely to be noticed? Less, said Bree. And the mare said, Oh, do, let's. I should feel much more comfortable. We're not even certain of the way. I'm sure a great charger like this knows far more than we do. Oh, come on, Bree, said Shasta, and let them go their own way. Can't you see they don't want us? We do, said Quinn. Look here, said the girl. I don't mind going with you, Mr. Warhorse, but what about this boy? How do I know he's not a spy? Why don't you say at once that you think I'm not good enough for you, said Shasta. Be quiet, Shasta, said Bree. The Tarkina's question is quite reasonable. I'll vouch for the boy, Tarkina. He's been true to me and a good friend, and he's certainly either a Narnian or an Arkenlander. All right, then, let's go together. But she didn't say anything to Shasta, and it was obvious that she wanted Bree, not him. Splendid, said Bree. And now what, that we've got the water between us and those dreadful animals, what about you two humans taking off our saddles and all our having a rest and hearing one another's tales? Both the children unsaddled their horses, and the horses had a little grass, and Ervis produced a rather nice things to eat from her saddlebag, but Shasta sulked and said no thanks, and that he wasn't hungry, and he tried to put on what he thought very grand and stiff manners, but as a fisherman's hut is not usually a good place for learning grand manners, the result was dreadful. And he half knew that it wasn't a success, and then became sulkier and more awkward than ever. Meanwhile, the two horses were getting on splendidly. They remembered the very same places in Narnia, the grasslands up above Beaver's Dam, and found that they were some sort of second cousins once removed. This made things more and more uncomfortable for the humans, until at last Bree said, And now, Tarkina, tell us your story, and don't hurry it. I'm feeling comfortable now. Erebus immediately began, sitting quite still and using a rather different tone and style from her usual one, for in Calamon, storytelling, whether the stories are true or made up, is a thing you are taught, 
just as English boys and girls are taught essay writing. The difference is that people want to hear the stories, whereas I never heard of anyone who wanted to read the essays. Chapter 3. My name, said the girl at once, is Erevis Tarkina, and I am the only daughter of Kidrash Tarkin, the son of Rishti Tarkin, the son of Kidrash Tarkin, the son of Is... Ilzo... Ilzumbre, ooh, that's a hard one to say, Tisrock, the son of Ardib Tisrock, who was descended in a right line from the god Tash. My father is the lord of the province of Calavar, and is one who has the right of standing on his feet in his shoes before the face of the Tisrock himself. May he live forever. My mother, on whom be the peace of the gods, is dead, and my father has married another wife. One of my brothers has fallen in the battle against the rebels in the far west, and the other is a child. Now it came to pass that my father's wife, my stepmother, hated me, and the sun appeared dark in her eyes as long as I lived in my father's house, and so she persuaded my father to promise me in marriage to Ahoshta Tarkin. Now this Ahoshta is a base birth, though in these latter years he has won the favor of the Tisrock, may he live forever, by flattery and evil counsels, and is now made a Tarkin and the lord of many cities, and is likely to be cho chosen as the Grand Vizier when the present Grand Vizier dies. Moreover, he is at least sixty years old, and has a hump on his back, and his face resembles that of an ape. Nevertheless, my father, because of the wealth and power of this Ahoshta, and being persuaded by his wife, sent messengers offering me in marriage, and the offer was favorably accepted, and Ahoshta sent word that he would marry me this very year at the time of high summer. When this news was brought to me, the sun appeared dark in my eyes, and I laid myself on my bed and wept for a day. But on the second day I rose up and washed my face and caused my mare Huynh to be saddled and took with me a sharp dagger which my brother had carried in the western wars and rode out alone. And when my father's house was out of sight and I was come to a green open place in a certain wood where there were no dwellings of men, I dismounted from Huynh, my mare, and took out the dagger. Then I parted my clothes, where I thought the readiest way lay to my heart, and I prayed to all the gods that as soon as I was dead I might find myself with my brother. After that, I shut my eyes and my teeth and prepared to drive the dagger into my heart. But before I had done so, this mare spoke with the voice of one of the daughters of men and said, O oh, my mistress, do not by any means destroy yourself, for if you live, you may yet have good fortune, but all the dead are dead alike. I didn't say it half so well as that, muttered the mare. Hush, ma'am, hush, said Bree, who was thoroughly enjoying the story. She's telling it in the grand calamine manner, and no storyteller in a Tisrock's court could do it better. Pray, go on, Takina. When I heard the language of men uttered by my mare, continued Erebus, I said to myself, the fear of death has disordered my reason and subjected me to delusions, and I became full of shame, for none of my lineage ought to fear death more than the biting of a gnat. Therefore I addressed myself a second time to the stabbing. But Wynne came near to me and put her head in between me and the dagger and discoursed to me most excellent reasons, and rebuked me as a mother rebukes her daughter, and now my wonder was so great that I forgot about killing myself and about Ahoshta and said, Oh, my mare, have you, how have you learned to speak like one of the daughters of men? And Wynne told me what is known to all this company, that in Narnia there are beasts that talk, and how she herself was stolen from thence when she was a little foal. She told me also of the woods and waters of Narnia, and the castles and great ships, till I said, In the name of Tash and Azeroth and Zardina, Lady of the Night, I have a great wish to be in that country of Narnia. Oh, my mistress, answered the mayor, if you were in Narnia, you would be happy, for in that land no maiden is forced to marry against her will. And when we had talked together for a great time, hope returned to me, and I rejoiced that I had not killed myself. Moreover, it was agreed between Quinn and me that we should steal ourselves away together, and we planned it in this fashion. 
We returned to my father's house, and I put on my gayest clothes and sang and danced before my father and pretended to be delighted with the marriage which he had prepared for me. Also, I said to him, O oh, my father, and O oh, the delight of my eyes, give me your license and permission to go with one of my maidens alone for three days into the woods to do secret sat sacrifices to Zardina, lady of the night and of maidens, as is proper and customary for damsels when they must bid farewell to the service of Zardina and prepare themselves for marriage. And he answered, O oh, my daughter, and O oh, the delight of my eyes, so shall it be. But when I came out from the presence of my father, and I went immediately to the oldest of his slaves, his secretary, who had dandled me on his knees when I was a baby, and loved me more than the air and the light, and I swore him to be secret, and begged him to write a certain letter for me, and he wept, and implored me to change my resolution. But in the end, he said, to hear is to obey, and did all my will, and I sealed the letter, and hid it in my bosom. But what was in the letter? asked Shasta. Be quiet, youngster, said Bree. You're spoiling the story. She'll tell us all about the letter in the right place. Go on, Tarkina. Then I called the maid who was to go with me to the woods and perform the rites of Zardina and told her to wake me very early in the morning. And I became merry with her and gave her wine to drink. But I mixed, mixed such things in her cup that I knew she must sleep for a night and a day. As soon as the household of my father had committed themselves to sleep, I arose and put on an armor of my brother's, which I always kept in my chamber in his memory. I put into my girdle all the money I had and certain choice jewels, and provided myself also with food, and saddled my mare with my own hands, and rode away in the second watch of the night. I directed my course not to the woods, where my father supposed that I would go, but north and east to Tashvan. Now for three days and more, I knew that my father would not seek me, being deceived by the words I had said to him. And on the fourth day, we arrived at the city of Azimbalda. Now Azimbalda stands at the meeting of many roads, and from at the posts of the Tisrock, may he live forever, ride on swift horses to every part of the empire. And it is one of the rights and privileges of the greater Tarkins to send messages by them. I therefore went to the chief of the messengers in the house of imperial posts in Azimbalda and said, O oh, dispatcher of messages, here is a letter from my uncle Ahoshta Tarkin to Kidrush Tarkin, lord of Kalavar. Take now these five crescents and cause it to be sent to him. And the chief of the messengers said, To hear is to obey. This letter was feigned to be written by Ahoshta, and this was the signification of the writing. Ahoshta Tarkin to Kidrush Tarkin, salutation and peace. In the name of Tash, the irresistible, the inexorable, be it known to you that as my, I made my journey towards your house to perform the contract of marriage between me and your daughter Erevas Tarkina, it pleased fortune and the gods that I fell in with her in the forest when she had ended the rites and sacrifices of Zardina according to the custom of maidens. And when I learned who she was, being delighted with her beauty and discretion, I became inflamed with love, and it appeared to me that the sun would be dark to me if I did not marry her at once. Accordingly, I prepared the necessary sacrifices and married your daughter the same hour that I met her and have returned with her to my own house. And we both pray and charge you to come hither as speedily as you may, that we may be delighted with your face and speech, and also that you may bring with you the dowry of my wife, which by reason of my great charges and expenses I require without delay." And because thou and I are brothers, I assure myself that you will not be angered by the haste of my marriage, which is wholly occasioned by the great love I bear your daughter, and I commit you to the care of all the gods. As soon as I had done this, I rode on in all haste from Azimbalda, fearing no pursuit and expecting that my father, having received such a letter, would send messages to Ahoshta or go to him himself, and that before the matter was discovered, I should be beyond Tashban. And that is the pith of my story until this very night, when I was chased by lions and met you at the swimming of the salt water. And what happened to the girl, the one you drugged? asked Shasta. Doubtless she was beaten for sleeping late, said Erevis coolly, but she was a tool and spy of my stepmother's. I am very glad they should beat her. 
I say that was hardly fair, said Shasta. I did not do any of these things for the sake of pleasing you, said Erebus. And there's another thing I don't understand about that story, said Shasta. You're not grown up. I don't believe you're any older than I am. I don't believe you're as old. How could you be getting married at your age? Erebus said nothing, but Bree at once said, Shasta, don't display your ignorance. They're always married at that age in the great talking families. Shasta turned very red, though it was hardly light enough for the others to see this, and felt snubbed. Erebus asked Bree for his story. Bree told it, and Shasta thought that he put in a great deal more than he needed about the falls and the bad, bad riding. Bree obviously thought it very funny, but Erebus did not laugh. When Bree had finished, they all went to sleep. The next day, all four of them, two horses and two humans, continued their journey together. Shasta thought it had been much pleasanter when he and Bree were on their own, for now it was Bree and Erebus who did nearly all the talking. Bree had lived a long time in Calerman and had always been among Tarkins and Tarkins' horses, and so of course he knew a great many of the same people and places that Erebus knew. She would always be saying things like, But if you were at the fight of Z Zulindra, you would have seen my cousin Alamash. And Bree would answer, Oh, yes. Alama, she was only captain of the chariots, you know. I don't quite hold with chariots or the kind of horses who draw chariots. That's not real cavalry. But he is a worthy nobleman. He filled my nose bag with sugar after the taking of Tibeth. Or else Bree would say, I was down at the Lake of Mesriel that summer. And Erebus would say, Oh, Mesriel, I had a friend there. Lasarline Tarkina, what a delightful place it is. Those gardens and the Valley of the Thousand Perfumes. Bree was not in the least trying to leave Shasta out of things, though Shasta sometimes nearly thought he was. People who know a lot of the same things can hardly help talking about them, and if you're there, you can hardly help feeling you're out of it. Quinn, the mare, was rather shy before a great war horse like Bree and said very little, and Erebus never spoke to Shasta at all if she could help it. Soon, however, they had more important things to think of. They were getting near Tashban. There were more and larger villages and more people on the roads. They now did nearly all their traveling by night and hid as best they could during the day. And at every halt, they argued and argued about what they were to do when they reached Tashban. Everyone had been putting off this difficulty, but now it could be put off no longer. During these discussions, Erevis became a little, a very little less unfriendly to Shasta, one usually gets on better with people when one is making plans than when one is talking about nothing in particular. Bree said the first thing to do now to do was to fix a place where they would all promise to meet on the far side of Tashban, even if, by any ill luck, they got separated in passing the city. He said the best place would be the tombs of the ancient kings on the very edge of the desert. Things like great stone beehives, he said. You can't possibly miss them, and the best of it is that none of the Calamines will go near them because they think the place is haunted by ghouls and are afraid of it. <coughs> Erebus asked if it wasn't really haunted by ghouls, but Bree said he was a free Narnian horse and didn't believe in these Calamine tales. And then Shasta said he wasn't a Calamine either and didn't care a straw about these old stories of ghouls. This wasn't quite true, but it rather impressed Erebus, though at the moment it annoyed her too. And of course she said she didn't mind any number of ghouls either. So it was settled that the tombs should be their assembly place on the other side of Tashban. And everyone felt that they were getting on very well till Huyn humbly pointed out that the real problem was not where they should go when they had got through Tashban, but how they were, get, how they were to get through it. We'll settle that tomorrow, ma'am, said Bree. Time for a little sleep now. But it wasn't easy to settle. Erevis's first suggestion was that they should swim across the river below the city during the night and not go into Tashban at all. But Bree had two reasons against this. One was that the river mouth was very wide and it would be far too long a swim for Huyn to do, especially with a rider on, his back, on her back. He thought it would be too long for him to do... He thought it would be too long for himself, too, but he said much less about that. 
The other was that it would be full of shipping, and of course anyone on the deck of a ship who saw two horses swimming past would be almost certain to be inquisitive. Shasta thought they should go up the river above Tashban and cross it where it was narrower, but Bree explained that there were gardens and pleasure houses on both banks of the rivers for miles, and that there would be Tarkins and Tarkinas living in them and riding about the roads and having water parties on the river. In fact, it would be the most likely place in the world of, for meeting someone who would recognize Erevis or even himself. We'll have to have a disguise, said Shasta. Gwyn said it looked to her as if the safest thing was to go right through the city itself from gate to gate, because one was less likely to be noticed in the crowd. But she approved of the disguise as well. She said, both the humans will have to dress in rags and look like peasants or slaves, and all Erevis's armor and our saddles and things will be made into bundles and put on our backs, and the children just pretend to drive us and people will think we're only pack horses. My, my dear Quinn, said Erevis rather scornfully, as if anyone could mistake Bree for anything but a war horse, however you disguised him. I should think not indeed, said Bree, snorting and letting his ears go ever so slightly back. I know it's not a very good plan, said Quinn, but I think it's our only chance. And we haven't been groomed for ages, and we're not looking quite ourselves, at least I'm sure I'm not. I do think if we get well plastered with mud and go along with our heads down as if we're tired and lazy and don't lift our hooves hardly at all, we might not be noticed, and our tails ought to be cut shorter, not neatly, you know, but all ragged. My dear madam, said Bree, have you pictured yourself to yourself how very disagreeable it would be to arrive in Narnia in that condition? Well, said Wynne humbly, she was a very sensible mare. The main thing is to get there. Though nobody much liked it, it was Wynne's plan which had to be adopted in the end. It was a troublesome one and involved a certain amount of what Shasta called stealing and Bree called raiding. One farm lost a few sacks that evening and another lost a coil of rope the next. But some tattered old boy's clothes for Erevis to wear had to be fairly bought and paid for in a village. Shasta returned with them in triumph just as evening was closing in. The others were waiting for him among the trees at the foot of a low range of wooded hills which lay right across their path. Everyone was feeling excited because this was the last hill. When they reached the top, the ridge at the top, they would be looking down on Tashban. I do wish we were safely past it, muttered Shasta to Wynne. Oh, I do, I do, said Wynne fervently. <clears throat> that night, they wound their way through the woods up to the ridge by a woodcutter's track, and when they came out of the woods at the top, they could see thousands of lights in the valley below them. Shasta had no notion of what a great city would be like, and it frightened him. They had their supper, and the children got some sleep, but the horses woke them very early in the morning. The stars were still out, and the grass was terribly cold and wet, but daybreak was just beginning, far to their right across the sea. Erevis went a few steps away into the wood and came back looking awed in her new ragged clothes and carrying her real ones in a bundle. These and her armor and shield and scimitar and the two saddles and the rest of the horse's fine furnishings were put into the sacks. Bree and Huynh had already got themselves as dirty and bedraggled as they could, and it remained to shorten their tails. As the only tool for doing this was Erevis's scimitar, one of the packs had to be undone again in order to get it out. It was a longish job and rather hurt the horses. My word! said Bree. If I wasn't a talking horse, what a lovely kick in the face I could give you. I thought you were going to cut it, not pull it out. That's what it feels like. But, in spite of semi-darkness and cold fingers, all was done in the end. The big packs bound on the horses, the rope halters, which they were now wearing instead of bridles and reins, in the children's hands, and the journey began. Remember, said Bree, keep together if we possibly can. If not, meet at the tombs of the ancient kings, and whoever gets there first must wait for the others. And remember, said Shasta, don't you two horses forget yourselves and start talking, whatever happens. And that's the end of today's readings. Talk to you tomorrow.